Hello, this is Andy Schaefers with Acuity. I've got another NX Cam video for you today. Typically, my videos are of fundamental concepts of NX Cam oriented towards newer users, but today I've got an advanced topic and a challenge for machining this teal colored surface here. Before we get started, I'm going to lay out the specifics of the challenge and our general workflow. Let's have a look in more detail at the surface. I'm going to turn on the poles. And as we look at this, it appears to be a pretty straightforward application of multi-axis machining in NX Cam, where we could just use a SWARF drive. However, in our challenge today, we're saying we don't have a five-axis machine tool. We have a fourth-axis machine tool. So it would appear that a SWARF drive is not going to be an option for us here. We'll have to just use a ball end mill and color cut this and then hand finish it. But the customer has required that this job needs to be done with minimum cycle time and they're willing to allow deviations. In other words, we don't have to follow the surface. They are saying we must follow the edges though. So our job then is to use a fourth axis swarf technique while checking to the top and bottom edge as we move along in X. The, uh, the multi-axis algorithms that we have in NX Cam aren't really set up for this situation. They're going to want to derive their tool axis from the surface or maybe something like interpolated tool axis, which still isn't really following this curve. As a quick aside, let's look at the best we can probably do with one of those algorithms. So I've got the variable contour already set up and it is using surface area where my drive is this surface. And then on tool axis, I'm using the four axis normal to drive. Let's look at those options. I've just changed the rotation angle to, to 90 degrees. And we'll generate that. Uh, here's our tool path. And now let's verify. Okay. Uh, it looks pretty good, but upon analysis here, uh, we, we do see a couple of problems. Uh, here at this area, I've got excess material, you know, 25, 26 thousandths, and areas like this, uh, that's a gouge of 15 thousandths. So it looks like it's doing a, you know, a really nice job here where the surface is sort of regular, but anywhere where I'm kind of ramping and I've got an irregular uh, relationship between the top and bottom curve. That's where I'm either leaving excess material or I'm gouging. So we're going to come up with our own technique here and we're going to use assembly modeling techniques in NX to position a tool. Then we're going to push that tool position into a generic motion operation in manufacturing. So the tool that you see here on the screen really isn't a tool at all. It's a component in assembly. It just happens to be the same diameter as my tool. So we'll use that as kind of a surrogate to do our positioning before we actually flip over to the manufacturing side. All right, let's get started with our solution. The first thing I need are two continuous curves, top and bottom, on which to drive the tool. If I just start picking edges here, um, assembly is not go going to allow me to transition from one to the other. So here in the curve section, I'll choose composite curve. And I need to be very careful here, but under join curves, I must join them together. Let's flip the direction on that one. Okay, there are the two curves. Next, I'm going to extend this curve a little bit and I'll explain why in a few minutes. I'm using the curve length command and I'll just extend that out 10 thousandths of an inch. Now I need to create a datum plane here on the end of this curve. And actually, just to make things a little easier, I'm going to hide the uh, display of that solid for now. I 
I'll use point and direction. And I want to be very careful here because by default it's wanting to use the normal direction from the curve. That is not what I want. I need to pick up the direction that is normal to the fourth axis of the machine. Let's flip that around. So that's the plane that my tool needs to lie in in order to meet the requirement of a fourth axis cut. But we want to be able to position the plane anywhere in X. So I'll create a second plane. at a distance. So here you see my plane at one inch, but I actually want to drive this with a formula. And here you can see that I've already created a variable called distance. So I want to type that into my field here. This will then allow me to drive the position of that plane using the expression system, specifically the variable named distance. Next, let's get started with the assembly relationships. I'll sort of drag my tool generally into position here. The first relationship I'd like to place is to grab that axis and make it parallel to that plane. Next, I'll select the upper curve and the face of the tool, the surrogate tool then the lower curve. Let's click OK. Now that we have some relationships placed, let's test our setup. I want to be careful about not making too big of a change because there's a chance that the tool could try and flip to the other side of the curve if the solver gets confused. But there's a 0.8 inches that looks fine. Let's try half an inch. I see it tipping up. That also looks correct. Now let's start backing it in towards the origin here. And I think probably the closest I can get is about 14 thousandths. Okay, now I said I was going to explain why I extended that curve. At this time, let's have a look right down on the top of the tool. So I'll select it, hit F8. And you can see he that this curve here is the lower curve. This is the upper curve. Because these are general curves are not at the same slope, we get into a situation where we're checking to the curve here at this location on the bottom, but the top curve is checking way over here. So potentially there could be some material that we could miss. By extending the curve at the bottom, you've got more region out here to check to to get more into this area. But for our example, we'll just stay with the 14 thousandths where we're at right now. It does kind of indicate, though, you know, if you were thinking, oh, why don't we just create a ruled surface through those two curves and machine it? Well, the center line of the tool does describe a ruled surface, but the actual part surface is not that simple. You could see here that even in that one position, the tool, uh, the, the location of the tool checking to our surface is actually climbing along a kind of a conic shape, not just a simple ruled surface. Okay, let's turn our part back on. One thing we've not constrained on our tool is its position in Z depth. It's checking to the two curves 
it's staying in the fourth axis plane, but we don't really have any way to control its depth as it moves along these curves. So let's do one more thing. We're going to create a surface that we can attach using the assembly relationships to the center point of our tool. For now, I'll hide that tool, or really the, the tool component. I'm going to use a law extension surface as the entity I'll use to control this. Here's the curve, and here's the face. I'm using a 90 degree angle, and I do want to be careful here. You can see I've got, it's wanting to create two surfaces. Uh, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to open this tolerance up. And now my result is just a single surface. Then let's create an offset. Now I'll bring the tool back and let's use our assembly relationships one more time. I'm going to be careful that I have my center arc center filter turned on. And with those two selections then I've created a fourth relationship that maintains the center of the tool on that surface. Next, let's switch to manufacturing. I have my generic motion operation already created, but it's empty. There are no sub-operations in it. I want to run you through manually what we're going to create as we move along in the X direction. The sub-op we're looking for is a rotary point vector move. This requires two inputs, first an endpoint, which is just the center of the tool, and then an axis, or direction. And I'm just aligning the real tool in manufacturing to the surrogate tool I've been using for assembly. That then creates the rotary point vector move here at the very beginning. You can imagine that I could then move that distance expression out another 10 thousandths or so. That would reposition the assembly tool and then I could create another sub-op and continue going like that until I finish the job. That's going to take a long time. It's going to take about 500 of those to express this surface uh, using these rotary point vector moves. So that's kind of the right idea, but not a good option. We want to use automation to do this part of the job for us. I'm going to now show you a Python program that I wrote to do this very thing. I try to keep my video somewhat short, so I'm not going to go through all the details here. But what it's doing is identifying that tool component, and then these are the identifiers for a datum thesis that exists right there in that tool component. So I'm after the origin of that datum thesis, which is this variable, and then the tool axis this variable represents that vector. Then I just add a loop here, and as I'm looping through the rest of the program, all it's really doing is creating that rotary point vector move that I showed you inside the, uh, the generic motion operation right here. And it just loops through that uh, until it gets to the end, which is expressed here as 3.04 inches. I'll move this off the screen and I'll just hit the play button. You see the jerky motion as 
each time it repositions the tool and it recomputes that sub-op and it's dumping it into generic motion. At this point, you don't really need to see all of the details, so I'm going to speed the video through this portion. The generic motion operation is completed. I'm going to hide this tool. And now let's have a look at what's been created in generic motion. As I scroll down, you can see we've got uh, over 300 of these rotary point vector moves. At this time, we're going to then switch from assembly to our objects in manufacturing. Let's run a verification on the actual tool. Okay, that looks like the correct result. I'm going to do that one more time and uh, hide the model so we can see exactly what that surface looks like. It looks like a, a pretty smooth cut. Now, if I saw an area where uh, I felt like I needed more definition, I'd go back into the Python program and change the step over in a particular area of X dimensions, maybe make it 4,000s instead of 8,000s. But th this all looks pretty clean, though. If we were to complete this job, here's what we would do. As you can see, there are no lead-in, lead-out moves. The Python program did not accommodate those, but they can be added manually now that we're done. So here I might say, let's add a new sub-operation. And this would just be a um, linear move along a tool axis. And here's a rapid move then away from the part. One final detail, uh, what if I wanted to add a roughing pass? Well, what I would do is return back to the tool. And I would adjust it and make the diameter of the assembly tool or the surrogate tool slightly larger. I would then rerun the Python program, and that would give me a generic motion operation that was somewhat farther off the surface. But then I would just attach the same tool to it, and that would leave a gap for my roughing pass. Okay, that's the uh, end of our challenge today. I hope you found this information useful.